Sorry. I'm going to start, I think, <laughs> with one of my favorite prayers from the prayer book. The Lord be with you. Also, also with, you. with you. Let us pray. O God of peace, who has taught us that in returning and rest, we will be saved. In quietness and confidence will be our strength. By the might of your spirit, lift us, we pray, to your presence where we may be still and know that you are God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to try to share my screen. And hopefully all will be well. Um, well, we are talking today about Anglican spirituality, so let's just break that down a little bit to get started. What do we mean by spirituality? And this is the part where you're invited to participate. How do you define spirituality? No right answer to this one. I've always thought that God um, installed in us a capacity to sort of seek outside the rational mind. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I refer to as spirituality. Mm -hmm. Our hearts are restless, as Augustine said, till they rest in you. There's something in us that is seeking connection with something beyond ourselves. Other, um, I've always seen it. Oh, go ahead, Julia. Um, I was just going to say that to me, spirituality is at the core of who I am and, and is my moral compass. It's where I find, where I hope to find the direction um, mm-hmm. that I need to live, to live my best life um, within God's. Um, teachings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the definitions that I found said the basic value of which around which all our other values are focused. And I think Mm -hmm. that's kind of in line with how you're talking about that, Julie. I've thought about it as uh, spirituality is the way we um, embrace and engage in our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Also the way in which we engage with uh, the world with nature and with others, mm-hmm. but that combined, it's not one or the other. Mm-hmm. With that. Any other definitions or things you want to throw out around that? It means different things to different people, right? I mean, and people talk about spirituality who aren't Christian, um, we define ours in a particular way because of Jesus Christ and because we believe that Jesus shows us the faith of God in a sense, but can be broader than just Christian spirituality. I'm, I look at it as my, my connection to others. Mm. The word spirit is, has its origins in Greek. Yeah. The air that we breathe and share. Um, and so in sharing all that that breath and uh, that's a form of connection with others. Mm-hmm. And it also becomes the basis of how we treat others um, in that we share this space together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, uh, I think it was Teresa of Avila said, we measure our communion with God by how it impacts the way we connect to other people, right? If if it's not making you more loving, um, then you might be missing the point. Um, I think I look at it as searching always and looking around and realizing that God's spirit is in us, in others, and in all that's around us. Mm. That's a beautiful way to say that. Am I coming through? Yes. 
Yeah. Hey, Bruce. I was, I was struck last week um, when Amy commented that she, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of Christians who pr profess all sorts of beliefs, but whose lives don't really seem to reflect Christian values. And we know there are, those people are out there. And Amy said she'd met so many other people, on the other hand, who didn't really, uh, you know, subscribe to this, that, or the other belief, but whose, li whose lives did tend to, you know, at least to some degree reflect Christian values. And I really mm -hmm. identified with that. I'm, I'm not emotionally, you know, <coughs> invested in any, any particular definition of spirituality with my agnostic, you know, turn of mind. Mm -hmm. But uh, it seems to me that, uh, and I'm glad to know that uh, when one do, do, does good things in the real world, that that can be viewed as spirituality. <laughs> so I yeah, like that. I like yeah. that. <laughs> and we're going to talk about uh, service as an expression of spirituality, right? Because some people find more contemplative forms of spirituality nurturing, and some people find their connection to God through serving others. So we'll explore a little bit of that today. Well, thank well, you for your input. Oh, go ahead. I realized that I, I really could be of a lot more service to others than I really am in my life. <laughs> but. Yeah. But sometimes I come through. <laughs> All right. Well, is, since we're talking about Anglican spirituality, what do we mean by Anglican? Um, we talked about that last week, kind of laid the groundwork for what that means, and we'll kind of continue to explore what that means. Um, Nicole said a contested identity um, is part of how we think about that. But the basic definition is it means we're part of the Anglican communion. And uh, she gave us some statistics last week about kind of the breakdown of the change in how we're distributed around the world. But you might be interested to know that we are considered the third largest religious body in the world after the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox. Um, 85 million people, 165 countries. So we are one branch of that. So then, uh, what is Anglican spirituality? You probably already know that there's not one way to answer that question. The Anglican gift is that we can kind of hold many different ways of expressing our spirituality in tension with each other so that we're all kind of enhanced by this diversity of ways to be Anglican. And I do love that about our tradition. Um, I don't, I don't want to get too down a rabbit hole on this, but I did want to at least mention that Urban Holmes, who was a professor at Swanee years ago, uh, talked about and wrote about spiritual types. And he kind of divided, he kind of drew out a little quadrant thinking and feeling we're here and cataphatic and apophatic we're here. And, and what he means by those terms, cataphatic is like drawn to what is revealed or defined. Apophatic means kind of drawn to what is unknowable. So mystery. Uh, and so he kind of puts people into different quadrants. We all fit multiple places in that. I mean, like with all personality type kind of stuff, but that there are people who uh, are drawn to the kind of thinking ways of connecting with God, like theology really gets them really excited. And then there's people who are drawn to more pietistic expression of faith in, in another quadrant. In another quadrant, he puts like contemplative types, people who are drawn to kind of mysticism uh, forms of Christianity. And then the fourth category uh, is are people who are drawn to service, to active kinds of spirituality. So you can kind of think about that. We Hopefully we find some expression in all of those different quadrants, but we might lean more towards one or another. And it's sometimes a good idea to think about pushing ourselves to try things outside our typical way of connecting to God. So if we're a contemplative type, we might push ourselves towards more acts of service for others as a way of connecting with God um, or vice versa. So 
Um, I just bring that up as a way, a kind of framework to think about there's lots of different ways we express that. So that I uh, kind of define Anglican spirituality by four characteristics. The first is liturgical. Um, praying shapes believing is one of our mantras, meaning the way that we pray shapes what we believe, how we believe, how we express ourselves to God and how we um, hear from God. And so that is part of what defines us. The, our tradition is not held together so much by a confession other than the ancient creeds, but our worship, what holds us all together is our common worship, our common prayer. Um, and praying with others shapes you and kind of makes you into one body. And I think that's really important about our tradition. And if you look at your prayer book, I should have invited you to have your prayer book out and beside you today. Um, you realize there's lots of ways that we pray together. The Eucharist, the great Thanksgiving is one of those ways. The daily office is another of those ways. We have a whole section. The whole Psalter is contained in our prayer book. That is another way to pray, to connect to God. And then there's, of course, prayers and thanksgivings, like the one that I opened with today. Um, to, there's, so there's lots of ways in our prayer book that we can express our spirituality. And I also think it's important to say we are learning how to pray as we pray together. And our prayer book helps us with that. So that was liturgical. The next way is incarnational. And let me just add, if you want to comment or question all along the way, just um, I can't see you if you raise your hand. So just uh, interrupt me. It's fine. Incarnational. Um, Another thing that's really distinctive about us, I think, as um, people of this tradition, incarnational meaning God in flesh, because of the incarnation, because God chose to be human, there is an appreciation for the presence of God in all things, in all people. Anglicanism is very much about the body, the body of believers, the church, our bodies, um, and we believe that God is present in the world around us and not just when we are gathered in the church together. Um, in our tradition, we might say the whole world is God's holy creation. Um, and you find evidence for that in our liturgical services because we bless homes, we bless fields, we bless animals. Um, in addition to blessing the articles that we use to enhance the beauty of our worship. And so um, we are incarnational, embodied, but also have a great appreciation for mystery as part of that. All right, the third uh, way that we think about that is sacramental. We have um, in this tradition two sacraments and five sacramental rites. And you may remember from your catechism training, if you had that, that a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. So when we talk about sacramental, uh, that we are sacramental people, it means we have a theology that is centered on the belief that God uses creation to communicate grace to God's people. Holy things are not just found in the church, and God's grace can come to us in many different ways. And God is not limited to working just in what we might consider spiritual ways. Um, remember that Jesus picked up a piece of actual physical bread and said, this is my body. And it was Jesus who said to use water for baptism. It was Jesus who picked up children and blessed them. We use oil as a visible reminder of Christ's presence. We occupy sacred buildings to remind us of God's presence, God's majesty. So we are sacramental people. And finally, apostolic. Um, and what I mean by that is we uh, believe in the apostolic faith. We affirm our commitment to that, which is God in three persons, Jesus Christ as redeemer of the world, 
the apostolic succession of bishops, scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, and then the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist are all part of what it means to have an apostolic faith. Let's talk about different ways that we express our spirituality in the Anglican tradition. And the first is worship. Worship is often what draws people into this tradition. If we were all on one screen together, I would ask for a show of hands. How many of you came to this tradition from other traditions because you were drawn to the worship? Um, I, that was definitely true for me. The first time that I walked into an Episcopal church, I kind of, uh, the way I describe it is my soul, like just this deep sigh of relief, like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. And this is what was missing for me that I didn't even know how to name because I had never experienced anything like that growing up um, in a Baptist tradition. And so um, our worship is grounded in the Book of Common Prayer. You can see some of the older iterations of the Book of Common Prayer, first published in 1549. And it was a mixture of ancient materials, some that go way, way back in the life of the church, and also theological thoughts of that day and that time period in the life of the church in the midst of the reformations that were going on then. Um, it was real genius that it provided a common English text so that the priest and the people could both take an active role in the worship of the church. And that was pretty radical, as you probably know, at that time in the life of the church. And so as we think about things that define worship in our tradition, I've listed some of those on the screen for us to consider and think about. The first is beauty. That is one of the things that drew me. Um, our liturgy, our churches, the gardens surrounding our churches, our music, the different elements of worship, um, all of these contribute to this appreciation of beauty that we have in our tradition. Um, I think it's also worth noting we have to be careful to appreciate the beauty of worship without making an idol out of it. And I do think that's one of the dangers of our tradition, that it is uh, easy to uh, begin to worship the form rather than what the form points us to, right? Um, we can make an idol out of anything. Um, and I came across a quote and I didn't write down who this was from, but worship too consumed by its own elegance is a worship of ourselves and the work of our own hands. I thought that was a really good way to think about it. I love the beauty of our worship, but it has to always be in the service of focusing us on God rather than an end in itself. Embodiment, we've already talked about that when we talked about incarnational uh, ways of being in our tradition. Um, our worship provides our bodies as well as our minds the opportunity to be engaged in worship. We stand, we sit, we kneel, we might bow or genuflect, we might make the sign of the cross. Our ears and our voices are engaged in worship by all kinds of music. We do things like laying on of hands or washing of feet because we believe that sense of touch conveys the grace of God. We even use the sense of smell in worship when we use incense or oil. Another thing that defines our worship is continuity. Continuity with the saints who have gone before us. Um, we are praying prayers, as I said, that have been prayed for hundreds and hundreds of years in the church. Um, we join our voices to the unending chorus of praise, of those who have gone before us. Um, and I find that really meaningful, that we have this continuity with the saints through the years. Repetition is another piece of that. We have a liturgical calendar that focuses us on the central mysteries of faith through the lenses of the seasons of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and that continuing witness 
in the world. And we relive that cycle every year as a way of letting it sink deeper into us again and again and again. Participation is something that I particularly appreciate about our tradition. One of the great things about Cranmer's prayer book is that it was written in the language of the people, which was radical at the time, so that they could participate in the liturgy instead of just observing it. Um, I'm guessing that some of you grew up Roman Catholic and might remember the time when the mass was all in Latin. Um, so Cranmer was doing a significant thing by making it so that clergy and laity alike could participate in worship together. Diversity within conformity. So uh, the Book of Common Prayer that we use in our tradition unites us with Anglicans all over the world, but it has a different flavor in each place, you might say. The Book of Common Prayer exists in 200 different languages. Um, some that you would expect, Spanish, French, Maori, some of you are familiar with the New Zealand prayer book, Creole, African dialects, Portuguese, Japanese, Lakota Sioux, Arabic. I mean, you might be amazed to know how many different languages the prayer book um, exists in. And like I said, each of those has its own um, influence by the culture in which it is prayed. Um, another way that we talk about diversity could be like high church and low church. You've heard those terms before. Um, some worship embraces the kind of ceremonial uh, piety of Anglo-Catholic or high church tradition. Um, and some prefer something more connected to the evangelical tradition, what some people might call low church um, and then many of us consider ourselves broad church, meaning we embrace elements of all of that. And then finally, as Nicole said last week, the inclusive way is part of what you might say defines us, the middle way. Um, and part of the way I think about that is the grace that our pews are wide enough, hopefully, for people of many different perspectives to worship together, or as Elizabeth is credited with saying, we don't make windows into men's souls. Um, we make space for a diversity of views as we worship together, because remember, it's our prayer that unites us rather than our belief system or more than our belief system. Our prayers of the people um, invite us to include a broad range of people and circumstances as it invites us to consider the needs of the whole world, um, balancing the individual with societal needs and petitions. Um, and our worship is inclusive of all of human life. From birth, we have a liturgy for Thanksgiving for the birth of a child, baptism, marriage, death. So a, um, a way to mark liturgically all the significant events of our lives. All right, you with me so far? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to show a clip, but I don't think we have time for that. But uh, I'm guessing some of you have seen Talladega Nights, the movie. Uh, and one of my favorite scenes in that movie is Ricky Bobby is praying the blessing before they eat. They're gathered around the table, and he says, Dear Lord, baby Jesus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes on to give thanks for his family in some maybe a little bit crass ways. And so his wife gives him a hard time about praying to baby Jesus. She says he did grow up, you know, and he says, I like the Christmas Jesus best when I'm saying grace. And when you say grace, you can say it to grown up Jesus or teenage Jesus, or bearded Jesus, or whoever you want. <laughs> and so he continues on, dear eight pounds, six ounce newborn infant Jesus, didn't even know a word yet, just a little infant, so cuddly, so omnipotent. Thank you for all the races that I've won, and for my $21.2 million. <laughs> it's an interesting scene, and it's uh, funny, even it's absurdity, but I think He's 
reflecting some things that uh, many people may struggle with um, around prayer or some assumptions that people may have that might not completely be in line with uh, what our theology around prayer might be. Um, One of those is he's talking about prayer as a one-way conversation. Um, he's, he's making Jesus into the image that he wants Jesus to be. I like the little cuddly baby Jesus in the golden fleece diapers. Um, and it's just interesting to see how they play with different images of God. And more than that, it's like, there is some gratitude in his prayer. I'll give him that, but also, uh, um, I pray so that God gives me what I want. And if I pray in a particular way, she, the wife tells him, make it a good prayer because I want you to win this race. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about what our tradition might say in contrast to that about prayer. This is from our catechism. What is prayer? And the catechism says prayer is responding to God by thought, and by deeds with or without words. That's a beautiful definition, I think. Responding to God, meaning God has already reached out to us. It can be by thought. It can be by deeds. And it may or may not involve words or talking. Um, Part of what I love about that is it's such a broad, inclusive way of thinking about prayer. I have lots of people tell me I'm not really good at prayer. Might be not that they're not good at prayer, but that their definition of prayer um, could be expanded a little bit. Talking to God about what we need or want for ourselves is one way of thinking about prayer. Um, but it can also be resting in God. We practiced that at our nine o'clock Eucharist service this morning that we're doing during the month of February. Instead of a homily, we have a few minutes of silence to just sit and rest in God's presence or to listen for what might God might have to say to us about the scripture readings for today or just to be. Um, knowing that as we're being, we are being in God's presence. Prayer is also for us communion with other people. Jesus tells us to pray for our enemies. It changes the way we see them. Um, It changes us, and it's really challenging. There's lots of other ways to think about prayer in our tradition. Rosaries silent meditation that we've already talked about, contemplative reading of holy texts, Lectio Divina is one way to think about that, walking the labyrinth, pilgrimages, retreats, silent days, all of those have a place in our tradition and are part of Anglican spirituality. Part of another thing that drew me to our tradition was um, was that, that prayer could be silence and The first church that I was a part of, the church where I was confirmed in Greenville, South Carolina as an adult, um, they had something called an Advent quiet day. And I'd never heard of that, but I sure did want to go. And it was so meaningful to me to have that space to just be, um, to be with God in that kind of way. So the daily office, um, that's another way that we think about spirituality in our tradition. And one of the things that's been so meaningful to me during the pandemic is that um, the day after we moved worship online back in March of 2020, um, I decided to offer morning prayer and see if anybody was interested in gathering on Zoom and Now, two years later, um, we're still doing that every Monday through Friday. And I love that. I found that so meaningful, particularly in the early days of the pandemic when we were all so disoriented to gather with some of you every morning at 9 a.m. gave some structure to my day. It gave me 
um, some grounding, spiritual grounding to start the day that way. And, um, and I think there's something so meaningful about ordering our lives around the daily office. Um, because remember the book of common prayer was meant for corporate worship, but Cranmer also intended that it would be a tool for private piety as well, that it would, that every person would have a prayer book in their own language, in their homes. And, um, the worship of the Anglican tradition is obviously corporate and public, but it is also private. Um, Morning and evening prayer are not offices that need to be led by clergy. They can be led by anyone. And in fact, we take turns doing that at our 9 a.m. morning prayer service during the week. If you've never come to that, uh, we invite you to join us anytime for that service. Um, so I put a few prayers here that I'm just, I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to give you a chance. Uh, hopefully some of these are familiar to you. The first one is a prayer from morning prayer. God, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning. I just love that. And then the second prayer is a prayer from evening prayer. Gracious light, pure brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven. Um, and then the final prayer also, I think, is from evening prayer, or maybe Compline. I can't remember. I think evening prayer. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness beautiful way to end the day and to remind ourselves that we are held um, in the steadfast love of God throughout the day and throughout the night. Following the hours of prayer in the prayer book gives us specific moments to stop and to orient our time and ourselves around being recollected to God is the language Teresa would use. Originally, everyone prayed the office daily um, in the early days of the church, and later it tended to be a monastic practice and not something that lay people did. And then uh, Cranmer, in his genius around the Book of Common Prayer, invited clergy and laity to make it part of their daily practice again. And so as we pray the daily office, we're praying those same words with Christians around the world each day, and I find a lot of comfort in that. You can see the influence of Benedictine monasticism, um, morning and evening prayer, and the significant use of psalms in worship. Um, and that practice comes, remember the verse in scripture that says, pray without ceasing. And that's one of the ways we think about that. It's keeping God present before us as we pray at different hours of the day. The Book of Common Prayer gives us what we might call a biblically infused faith. It invites us to cover almost the entire Bible through the tables of readings, takes us through the narrative of salvation history, invites us to read more than just our favorite passages of scripture, um, but invites us to kind of see the whole sweep. And we've seen that those of us who've been praying in prayer together will follow a particular book of the Old Testament through our reading for several days or weeks in a row, and it gives you a better sense of the broader um, story that's being told in Scripture. Like I said, if you'd like to join us for that, we invite you anytime to drop in and be with us in, in prayer, morning prayer. And then finally, another way that I think about Anglican spirituality and how we like to express spirituality is through service. Um, we don't serve meals at Gateway um, because God wants us to do nice things. We do it because of incarnation, what we already talked about. We believe God is there and that God is present in the relationships that we form as we partner with people in our community. Um, and the thread of this goes, uh, goes pretty far back in our tradition. 
You may remember that Henry VIII shut down the monasteries during the time of the English Reformation because he wanted to reclaim the land that the monasteries stood on and the assets. And so for a while, there was no uh, significant threat. There were some throughout, uh, throughout our Anglican history, but during the days of the Oxford movement, there was a revival of monasteries and part of that was deeply connected to caring for those who were impoverished in the SSJE that you've probably heard of, that we have some people connected to in our parish, were part of that work. Caring, um, caring for others was an important part of the way they expressed their spirituality. And I think for many of us, too, in this tradition, and some of you have already talked about that. So why does all this matter? What are the assumptions that we have that kind of get us to thinking about this? Um, and here are the ones that I have defined. God already loves us and is reaching us, reaching out to us all the time in lots of different ways. Some of you have named those different ways when we got started today, um, that spirituality is not one particular thing, but it can be anything that helps us deepen our connection to the God who loves us. Um, the state we are in now, we're always being invited to be transformed by God. Um, and that we have a role in that process and that spiritual practices can be one way that we are being transformed by God. Um, and as we look towards Lent in a couple of weeks, I think that um, these spiritual practices can be a guide for us in the Lenten season into deepening our movement towards God and towards loving other people, as some of you said. And so you might consider if there's a spiritual practice that you want to take up to help you draw into closer communion with God um, as we approach the season of Lent. Um, and the last thing that I will say is what I mentioned earlier, what Teresa said, the test of any spiritual practice is, does it make us more loving? Does it call us back to who God created us to be? All right. Now I'm interested in hearing your thoughts and reactions to all of that, because it's interesting when you're teaching on a subject like this or preaching or anything else. It, um, as soon as you say something, you could also say the opposite, and that would be true too. So, <laughs> so now I'm inviting you to uh, share your thoughts about spirituality or some other ways that we express our spirituality in this tradition that are different than those that I named, or to argue with me a little bit about some of that. I would like to say something. Yeah. Gretchen, uh, you probably need to lean forward a little bit so we can hear you well. Okay. From the moment I was born, I have been connected to spirituality. I cannot tell you exactly in what way, but my parents took me down to the South to see all my grandparents and so forth. And I was like six, six weeks old, and they, I had my, um, I was uh, the, at the little church there in Jacksonville, Florida. They had me being baptized there, and, it, and I, I've heard about these things for a long time, and it just made me just feel so kind of <laughs> welded into all of the people that were really part of my whole early life. And geez, I, you know, sometimes I've forgotten and I would get away from the church. That was only like one long time. Uh, broke both of us during, during some part of uh, when the, uh, so many, when, when the, in the South, all, all the Southerners wanted to keep on beaten up on black people. So uh, during that time, we quit coming to church uh, and we're trying to do other things. But I just feel like it just has been always there for me. 
and when, whenever and whatever. And this is not a big deal spirituality thing I'm trying to say. It was just like the love that just started mm. and it still continues. Yeah. And Bruce, Brucey has different ideas. Okay, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> well, Gretchen, I think it is connected to spirituality because another thing that we could name as a spiritual practice is the practice of remembering. Um, and what I hear you saying is that you you have these this lifetime of memories of that are meaningful to you that are connected to the church and um, you know th all throughout the Psalms and through the Hebrew Scriptures the people are invited to remember my prayer book <laughs> yeah there you go uh, the people are invited to remember remember how God led you through the Red Sea remember how God fed you with manna remember how God was with you and so I think that remembering those stories is a significant way of connecting to our spirituality and our faith. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Other thoughts? Somebody else surely knows what to say. Have an idea. Yeah. Um, speaking of remembering, that brings up something that actually I experienced this morning during Parish Hall Church, uh, which I really enjoyed. But um, um, during the quiet time, we're so seldom quiet in the parish hall <laughs> that I found myself sitting there for those few minutes just remembering mm. all the things that I've participated in in that room mm -hmm. over the last whatever it's been 15 or 16 years since we started, since that became our, our parish hall. And just, I, I, I don't know, I just, just random things came up, just meetings. Uh, wedding receptions, funeral receptions, dinners, agape supper, you know, just a whole panoply of things. And that's what I was doing during that quiet time. And it, it was very, it was very meaningful to me just to sit there and think about those things. That's so memory, cool. yes. Yeah, remembering yeah. is a powerful practice. And yeah, those walls do hold a lot of our common life together. And as you it said, made me think of that as as much of a sacred place as as much of a sacred space, yeah. really, as the church itself. Yeah, absolutely. In a kind of a different way. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. I I grew up moving around a lot, and I sort of came to think of the. Episcopal Church as my hometown oh, Be because wherever we went, um, my parents immediately found a church for us and it was a different church, but it was the same church. Um, when my sister started college, we were living overseas and she came back and we didn't see her for a year, but she will tell you that when she went to church, she was with us. Oh, um so that's that's just been a mm -hmm. it, it's family yeah. it's home yeah i agree i have a couple of things about the prayer book that are meaningful to me well there's a lot of things that are meaningful to me in the prayer book but one of the things um if you don't think that you have the time or inclination to go morning prayer and evening prayer through the whole thing, it starts on page 137. 137, the daily devotions for individuals and families. And it's one page that covers those four times. Now, I don't always do that, I'll admit. But I also admit that when I do that, my life and my, it, it's different. It's, it's really helpful to me. So you're reminding me to do this. And I also, um, I have said this to, to people, particularly, I guess, in the Wednesday service, but um, the prayer book is not secret and the services are not secret. And I, um, I have often said, uh, to people who are not ordained, 
to read the 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 great thanksgiving out loud in your mm. own place nobody's going to get you liturgically um yes that's what the priest says because if we all said it together it would be a little bit you know and and it's it's the priest's duty at sunday service to say it but those words are so wonderful and to say them out loud gets to your soul yeah and i invite people to do that um because it, I think it's it, it's an invitation that is worth worth doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great, Barbara. When I was considering uh, ordination in the Episcopal tradition, Wallace Marsh was my sponsor at the cathedral, and he invited me as a spiritual practice to pray with the ordination service, kind of along the same lines you're talking about. As I was doing discernment. Um, pray with that service and uh, use that as your kind of Lectio Divina, so to speak, and um, hear what God is saying to you through that. So, yeah, I think that's a great practice. I think a lot of, a lot of, um, for me, a lot of what I do in prayer is more listening than speaking um, although, um, I also think that, um, you know, no matter what you're going through, I, I, I think you, you know, it's helpful to voice that to God. If you're, if you're going through a tough time, uh, if, if what you're experiencing is anger against God, you know, um, and, um, I, I also think that some of us, for some of us, a spiritual life and kind of the life of a mystic comes more natural than to others. And um, I was kind of reminded that of that as you were speaking Gretchen and, um, uh, and, and my Daniel is different too. (laughs) Uh, uh, So I think we have sort of different, different kind of natural capacities for that. For some of some of us, it's very easy to, and uh, we just see it everywhere. (laughs) It's like, make it stop. Um, So at any rate, don't feel discouraged if it doesn't come naturally to you. Um, Kind of be patient with yourself. Um, Yeah, you can listen to that. You can do it. I agree with that, Paul. I grew up like just knowing one way to pray, like you have your list of people, kind of how we do. And that's important. But I, nobody had ever taught me that I could just be still and listen as a way of praying or that I could use my body as the way of praying. And um, it's part of what I appreciate about urban homes diagram is like, there's so many different ways you can express um, your connection with God and I appreciate that since I didn't have that experience growing up. And I think it's good what he says too about, you know, it's okay to push out of your comfort zone a little bit too and try things that are not your natural bent. Um, Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Nicole. Oh, I was going to say you talked about this too, but one of the things that remains powerful to me in the Anglican tradition is how, uh, is our, is our devotion also with the saints, um, in, in terms of, of thinking of how all we are, we are all present in Christ. And so some of these prayers that we've inherited over the years to pray them again, um, also makes me feel companioned in my spirit, knowing that, that so many have prayed these same prayers, uh, before me. And even if I don't even agree with some of the theology or some of the language, uh, in those prayers, uh, to enter into that though, feels, um, feels somehow like I'm being held beyond my own sort of self. And that remains a sort of powerful, uh, part for me, um, not only, not only when I pray or when I sort of think about the saints, but also in the way that our whole year is organized, that there are other people elsewhere who have done these very same things at these very same times, 
um, for years and years and years. And that's really powerful to me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. On this feast day of Absalom Jones. Well, thanks to all of you for engaging around this today. Next week, we um, will be blessed to have the Reverend Alan Samlin with us, both um, preaching at our 10 o'clock service and at 1115 um, uh, to talk with us about Anglican and Episcopal history. I'm really looking forward to um, engaging with that, with him and with all of you. Um, lots more good stuff to come. So thanks so much. Y'all have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With you. With Jean. To all of you. Take care. Thank everybody. you. See you. See you Tuesday, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye, everyone. See you Bye. Wednesday, Barbara. Bye, everyone.